Hello, and welcome to today's webinar with IOP ebook author Dr. Sam Illingworth. Sam is Senior Lecturer in Science Communication at Manchester Metropolitan University, where his current research involves looking at ways in which science can be used to empower society, as well as the relationship between science and poetry. He will be reviewing his latest book, Effective Science Communications, A Practical Guide to Surviving as a Scientist. During the webinar, we welcome your questions, so please use the Q&A facility and send them at any time during the talk. Sam will then try to answer as many as he can at the end of the presentation, and we will respond to any unanswered questions once the webinar is over. On that note, I'll hand over to Sam. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Anastasia. And hello, everybody. Welcome to this session on effective science communication. So, as introduced, my name is Sam Illingworth. I am a senior lecturer in science communication at Manchester Metropolitan University. And today I'm going to be talking about the IOP publishing book, Effective Science Communication, A Practical Guide to Surviving as a Scientist. And as well as myself, this book was written with Dr. Grant Allen, who is a reader in remote sensing at the University of Manchester. Sadly, Grant can't be with us today as he is out flying in the atmospheric research aircraft making measurements of atmospheric pollutants around the coast of Britain as we speak. So here's a picture of the book, which is Effective Science Communication that's just been released two weeks ago. And the purpose of this webinar is I'm going to just give a little flavor as to what's in the book, talk a little bit about the book's ethos, and a little bit about who the book is aimed at. There's going to be plenty of time for questions at the end, so please do write them in, and I'm happy to answer those at the end of the presentation. So the first thing I thought I'd talk about is really what skills do we think that scientists need? And it's very difficult, really, being a successful modern-day scientist, as we are expected to pretty much not only do, but excel at everything. We're expected to write papers, submit successful grant proposals, present to a variety of audiences, have dealings with the media, be that online or in print, engage with the public and communicate digitally. And the purpose of this book really was to start to pick apart all of these different skills because if we look at them, all they are really are different methods of communicating to a variety of different audiences. So each of the chapters in the book is split into a separate section that deals with a key topic, such as paper writing or grant writing or presentation skills. And what I'm going to do now is just give you a flavor of what are in some of those chapters. I'm not going to go through all of the chapters because we don't have, quite have time, and also because I want to leave a little bit of a surprise for you when you go on to purchase the book. So the first chapter really to look at is chapter three, which is about applying for funding. And I think that applying successfully for scientific funding can be an incredibly daunting task, not only to early career researchers, but to anybody all the way up to professoriate level. And what we've tried to do in this book, this is a figure from the book, is to pick apart some of the difficulties, some of the nomenclature that's involved in that. And this was a chapter that was very much led by Grant. Grant is extremely successful in funding application. He's brought in several million pounds worth of funds. I'm also successful in funding applications as well. And what we've tried to do is to pass across some of our experiences. Now, obviously, as with a lot of the information in the book, we're not saying that this is the only way. We're not saying that this is the way for every single situation. But what we've tried to do is to give an insight into what can be quite 
opaque areas sometimes. So by reading this chapter, you'll have a good idea not only of how to apply for funding, but also of the different stages that are necessary in order to do that successfully. We, we, we try to really demystify the funding process. And also, one of the unique selling points in the book really is that there's a series of exercises for you to do throughout the book. And these are exercises that very much will help you to improve your communication skills as a scientist. And the exercises that have been placed in chapter three very much lead you to construct your own research grant. And whether that's for the first time or for the seventh or eighth or hundredth time, I think it will be really useful in breaking that down and making it something that is more straightforward to manage so that by the end of reading that chapter, you not only have an idea of the funding process, but if you followed the exercises, you will also start to have the basis of a grant application itself. So chapter four looks at presenting. And the image that I've done here is taken, adopted really from a business paper by two authors called Peck and Dickinson in 2009. And it's a model of effective communication in which three things need to be considered, the narrative, the audience, and the self. And without all three of those aspects, then the triangle falls down and you don't have effective communication. So what we're saying here is really that in order to have effective communication, you need to think about the narrative, so that's what you're saying. You need to think about the audience, so that's who you're saying it to. And you need to think about the self, so that's how you are saying it. And this chapter really looks at mainly presenting in an, an oral case and mainly looking at presenting to other academics in an academic environment because presenting at conferences or symposia or group meetings is something that is a really large part of being a scientist. However, as with most of the skills that are covered in this book, we never really taught how to do it. And for me, presenting is something that a lot of scientists are just expected to do with no formal training whatsoever. And because of that, it's very easy to say, oh, well, presenting is difficult and I'm not a natural at presenting. But as with science, it's something that you can learn and it's something that comes with practice, practice and more practice. But what we hope to have done in this particular chapter is to present our experiences. I've personally presented at close to a thousand um, professional presentations in a variety of situations. So drawing on that experience, I also lecture on presentational skills and I speak across the country as a motivational speaker. So it's really drawing on that experience presenting a number of exercises, again, for you to do, some tips and some techniques, but really emphasizing this importance of practicing and also that they are skills that you can learn, providing that you're willing to learn them. So that by the end of this chapter, you'll have a really good handle on how to develop your narrative, how to consider your audience, and how to best present yourself so that people want to listen to what it is that you have to say. Chapter six is all about engaging with the mass media. And I just wanted to note, first of all, this is a cartoon taken from the book. We're really fortunate to have um, a fantastic cartoonist Paul Dickens from the Institute of Physics Publishing on board to do these cartoons for us. And we really think that they help to illustrate in an enjoyable but actually quite pertinent way some of the issues that we are discussing in the book. So chapter six talks about engaging with the mass media. 
and as scientists this is something that we are expected to do and which some of us maybe are more reticent than others to get involved with however it's something that can really help to develop not only our skill set but also to communicate our research and our scientific ethos to a much wider audience. Now again, Grant and myself have a lot of experience in dealing with the mass media, uh, both having appeared on television, on radio, in the, print, in, in the print press as well. And what we present in this chapter is drawing on that experience with personal anecdotes and again providing advice and some tips for how to deal with the media so that you definitely are able to convey your message in the way that you want to convey it. Now, historically, there's not always been the most appropriate or the most two-way communication between the media and scientists, and a lot of scientists See the media as something to be feared but I don't think that's the case and actually the media is something to be embraced and to work with providing that you are always able to stay on topic and that you remember that as a scientist you should really be speaking um, in a subject that you have expertise in so that again by the end of this chapter that has a number of exercises in it you'll have a better idea of the steps that are involved with engaging with the mass media and also how to best do that to utilize the skills and services that the mass media can provide to you as a scientist. The next chapter I wanted to talk about really is establishing an online presence. And I think that this is a really important aspect of being a modern day scientist. With the advent of the internet and social media, as illustrated from this image here, it's something that permeates our day-to-day -day life as human beings as well as scientists. And it can sometimes be a little overwhelming in terms of the number of social media and digital platforms and digital tools that are available to us. So what the essence of this chapter really is about is how to start unpicking all of those different social media and digital toolkits so that you can start to establish a strong online presence that helps to complement your research and to promote you as a researcher and as a scientist. One of the key aspects I talk about in this chapter really is the fact that it's impossible, I would argue, to have an effective online presence in all of these arenas. And the most effective way of establishing an online presence is to try a few of them out and then to see which ones work most effectively for you and if there's several that work which of them work in particular circumstances so for example speaking personally i know that having my own personal website is something that's really useful as it allows me to aggregate and curate all of my online blogs it allows me to have a a hub really for all of my online activity and a place where people can find me, people can get in contact with me and I can post a little bit more about my research and my particular interests. My website is very straightforwardly just www.samillingworth.com and you can see from there how I have set up my website. I set that up using Squarespace other website builders are available, but that was one that I found to be particularly straightforward to use. With regards to social media, I am very active in the Twitter sphere. I use Twitter quite a lot, and I find, so my um, Twitter hashtag is at Sam Illingworth, 
please do feel free to get in contact with me at any time, especially if your tweets involve either Japanese role-playing games or poetry and also science. And what I find with Twitter is that it's a really great medium with which to keep up to date with a variety of scientific questions, scientific research, and also to talk to scientists and to talk to science communicators from across the world to get their feedback, to get their points of view, and also to advertise my own research. So, for example, when I write a research paper, I find that tweeting about it can be really useful. We talk a little bit in the book about alt metrics and the importance for this for your publish, publishable articles. So Twitter is something that I have very strongly embraced and which I find to correlate quite nicely with the research that I do and with the research communities that I'm involved with. Facebook, I find, is something that I use to create events for, science communication events that I run, and also to engage with different groups with. But Facebook is also a social media site where I maintain a separate personal identity to my professional one. And I think that's something that's very important to consider and to be aware of. Now, when, for example, I use Twitter, I'm not saying that I'm only a scientist. I certainly inject my personality into that as well. But on Facebook, I do have I do tend to keep that to my um, friends or associates that I've known for a long time rather than to open it up to everybody um, because I think it's important to still be able to have a place online where you can maintain a personal identity that is markedly separate from a professional one which I certainly communicate more via Twitter. Um, I'm always exper experimenting with different social media platforms and it's worth noting out that social media platforms change. So the chapter, uh, the section in chapter 7 where I talk about Twitter is now slightly out of date in that I talk about the fact that in up until a few weeks ago, whenever you wanted to embed a photograph within Twitter, it would take up some of the 140 characters that you're allowed. However, a few weeks ago, Twitter changed that, and so that is no longer the case. Now, I do point out in the chapter that this is part, part and parcel of dealing with online toolkits and that things are subject to change and that things will quickly or eventually replace different toolkits as they go. So I think it's really important when you're establishing your online presence to dip your toe in as many of them as possible and then decide which of these arenas are most suited to your particular skill set, to your particular research, and also to your particular ethos. And again, throughout this chapter, there are a number of exercises that can help you start to develop a blog, to think about creating podcasts, how to um, build a Twitter following and profile, and then how to start pulling all that together potentially into creating your own website. So that really has given a brief overview of some of the chapters that are in this book, but who do we think should buy this book? Well, a number of people really. I think that this book is designed for researchers at all levels. So I've written down there early career researchers who want to get ahead in academia, early career researchers who want to leave academia, students who are interested in doing a postgraduate, experienced researchers who want to improve their communication, and anyone who wants to understand how to thrive as a scientist. So, as I outlined at the beginning of this webinar, it's really difficult to 
be a master of all of the skills that are expected of you as a modern day scientist and as a modern day academic. But I think that it is possible to master all of these skills. Sometimes, however, we just need a bit of a helping hand or we need somebody to point us in the right direction. And I think that that is what this book does. By all means, it can be read cover to cover, and it should be. But as well as that, it's a great reference for people to pick up when they might want to think about an upcoming presentation that they've got, or a grant proposal that they're writing, or a radio interview that they want to prepare for. And I just want to touch on as well the fact that this book is absolutely for people who want to leave academia as well. The last chapter in the book very much talks about how to establish a number of skills that will be useful for you as you're in your career as an academic, as a scientist, but also away from academia, away from science, and how you can market yourself in the job market using the very, very desirable skills and skill sets that you have built up during your time as a scientist. So I really do think that this book is for everyone that is either working in science or who wants to have a little peek behind the curtain as to what it might be like to work in science and to be a successful scientist. So where can you get this book? Well, it's available on Amazon as an e-book. Very shortly, it will be available as a hardback book as well. You can follow this link that I'll leave on the screen for another minute or so to go to the Institute of Physics Publishing web store. And later in this year, or the, very, or the beginning of next year, 2017, the book will also be available as a paper book. For those of you that are working in universities or research institutes, it's very possible for your university library to get hold of the e-book. So, for example, you can just email the librarian and ask them to get it, and then it's available to you. All of the e-book is... The, the hardback book is a, is a thing of beauty that is very nice to have on your bookshelf. And the e-book itself is also incredibly useful because all of the hyperlinks can just be clicked on directly to take you to the references that are there in order to have further reading. There's a number of different further studies that are available. And that is something that I would recommend you to continue to do. And to look at that as you go along and to follow the exercises to do the further studying and then that is the way that you will absolutely get the most from this particular book. So we've now got the point of the presentation where I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. So please do take your time to write it in the chat um, box and I will answer them. We've also we've already got a couple up here that I'll start to answer. So I'll start with these and then I'll read them out and then I'll respond to them. And please do write some more questions. I've just had somebody tweeting me as well asking if they can um, send me a direct message regarding the question. Very happy to do that. I'm trying to multitask crazily, um, putting my digital communication skills to the test. So the first question that I've been asked is how to have an effective communication with your supervisor. That's a very good question. And the book does actually talk about general skills in terms of how to make sure that people want to listen to what you have to say and so that you're able to communicate your message. Now, what I would say, one of the things I talk about in the book is before you start any presentation, before you start any telephone conversation, before you go into any meeting, a really good thing to do is to make a list, a bullet pointed list of the three or four key take home messages. And 
if you imagine that your presentation, your telephone conversation, your meeting with your supervisor goes exactly as you have expected, then what are the things that you would most like to get across? And if you just spend a few minutes thinking about that first of all, it can really help you to structure your narrative. And if you go into your meeting with your supervisor with a list of these three things that you really want to communicate, then you can tick them off. And you can, if the conversation veers off topic, you can pull it back to these things. So that by the end of that conversation with your supervisor, you, have, you are much more confident that you've actually managed to answer the questions that you had in the first instance. So I would say that communicating with your supervisor is the same as communicating with any audience. It's thinking about your narrative. It's thinking about your audience, like what is it that your supervisor actually wants from this meeting? And it's thinking about how you present yourself as well. So, you know, being confident and being aware of what it is that you want to get from that particular meeting will be the most beneficial to how that meeting with your supervisor will come about. So the second question that I would like to answer is, do you have any top tips for building up a following online, for instance, on Twitter? That is a very good question. I think that one of the things that can put us off using social media the most, especially Twitter, is if we only if we don't have many followers or if we don't have many people following our blogs or if we don't have many likes of our YouTube videos. And it can be disheartening. However, everything has to start somewhere. And you know that old adage of Rome wasn't built in a day is very, very true. My own personal Twitter following is about 2,300, but it started and very, very small with you know, a few people. But what I did was I developed a consistent message. So if people want to find out about science communication, in particular, the relationship between science and poetry, then they know that I am somebody who tweets about that not only my own research and thoughts, but also links to relevant resources, relevant competitions, relevant people that are also worth following. So really having an identity and a unique selling point that marks you out is something that will really, really help you to do that. The other aspect of building a good Twitter following is to really get involved with the communities. And this isn't just for Twitter. It's very easy to start posting things on blogs, posting videos, posting tweets, and just churning them out and posting them without having any interactions with the surrounding communities and you know in a way you're really missing out there because the whole point of social media is that it allows us to connect with such a great variety of people with such a wide um, variety of cultures and with such a wide variety of opinions that by not by just literally posting and dumping your thoughts without interacting with other people's thoughts and other people's research and other people's opinions means that you're missing out. Also, it means that you're not developing the community and you're not developing something that people will go on to want to find out any more about. So what I would say is, in order to build your Twitter following or in order to build the following in a blog or anything else, the most important thing is to do with getting involved with those communities. And 
the way to do that is to actually make sure that you are engaged in a conversation, that you are asking people their thoughts, that you are pushing other people, that you are asking other people their opinions, and that you're commenting on other people's blogs, that you're retweeting other people's tweets. And that is the best way to go about building a Twitter following or indeed a meaningful following in any community. It takes time, but it absolutely is worth it in the process. So another question that's come through is, how important is science communication for early career researchers? And this is a very interesting question. So science communication is a term that can have many different interpretations. I've written about this myself in my research. But I think what we're trying to do with the book is we're trying to look at the communication of science in general. So we're saying that science communication is communicating your science to a professional audience, to the general public, to the media, um, online digitally, to policy makers, and it's really looking at all of these different things. However, science communication is also about communicating science to non-experts which, for example, might be termed as outreach and public engagement. And for me, talking about science to non-experts, to the general public, to children, to policymakers, to people in the street, is really important. Not only because these people have a right to know about science, and to know about your research, but also because by communicating with these people, with communicating with these different audiences, what it enables us to do is to develop our own science and to look at different ways of looking at our research. Science can be quite insular sometimes, and by communicating our research to others is very important. Also, by communicating our research, it improves our general communication skills, our oral presentation skills, our written presentation skills, our networking skills. And all of these are really important assets to have, whether we stay within the field of science or if we leave academia. Specifically in relation to early career researchers, I think that Outreach and public engagement is really important. So in the past, it might well have been that outreach and public engagement were seen by many people wrongly as an additional aspect of altruism that wasn't going to be of any benefit to the person's professional career. However, what I would say is that this is beginning to change. And there's positions such as myself, you know, I've got a permanent lectureship in science communication, which I got off the back of developing a substantial public engagement and outreach portfolio. What I'd also say is that certainly in the UK, with the research excellence framework by which all universities are judged on the level of their research, impact, pathways to impact, so how our research affects society is a large part of that. In the next REF exercise in 2021, at least 20% of the research excellence framework is going to be made up of impacts. So impact, public engagement, outreach, whatever word you use to describe it, the considering the ways in which we communicate our research to non-experts in a meaningful manner is something that is becoming ever more prevalent and ever more important in the field of science. And as well as benefiting the people that we're communicating to altruistically, it benefits our own personal skill sets and ultimately it can help very much to benefit our professional career development. 
So another question that's come through is, what is the number one tip for presentations? Okay, the number one tip for presentations is to practice, practice, practice. I know that sounds incredibly banal, but it's true. I think when you're giving a presentation, the best thing you can do is to think about, first of all, what it is that you want to say, and that exercise that I talked about by writing down the three or four key take-home messages is really useful and really important. But the thing that detracts from a good presentation is when people look hesitant or people don't look quite certain as to what they're going to say next or what's on the next slide. So what I would say is just practice. And the more that you practice a presentation, the more confident you are with it, the more adept you are with it, and the more professionally you come across. So speaking personally, whenever I give a presentation, I will practice it at least five to 10 times. I do this with my lectures as well. I did it with this webinar. I do it when I'm talking to the general public. I do it when I'm talking to a scientific audience. I'll always practice. My, I'll practice the presentation with slides, if I'm using slides. I'll also practice it without slides, so I can have it, so I know where the transitions are going to be. I think that by doing this, it really gives me a lot of confidence that I know what I'm going to say. I would, wherever possible, advise against using a script. The problem with having a script is that you can start to sound very stilted. And also, if you've learned to script off by heart and you go up to the front and you start to say that script, what inevitably will happen is that part of it will be forgotten. And if you forget part of that script and you forget where you are and you've got no backup, that can be incredibly disheartening and very scary. So what I recommend doing instead is practicing the kind of thing you're going to say. So I, when I practice a presentation five, 10 times, I'll go through the presentation and I'll, I'll say what I'm going to say and then I'll do it again, and then a third time, and then a fourth time. And the chances are that what I'm saying sounds fairly similar, but I'll have set phrases or set ideas that I want to communicate rather than exact phrases, which means that by the time I come to deliver my presentation, I'm not remembering how to say a certain thing. I'm just remembering the practice that I've put in and I'm remembering that I know what I'm talking about and I know what is coming next and I know the kind of things that I'm going to say. So by practicing without a script but practicing five, six, seven, eight more times will absolutely help to aid you in your presentations and that's the number one tip that I can give. A follow-on question to that is somebody has asked how do I deal with nerves? Well that's a very interesting question and it is related really to the previous question to that in that the thing with nervousness is that it's normally the fear of the unexpected so when we come up and give a presentation we're, we're fearful that it's going to go very wrong or that we don't know what to expect. However, if we've practiced doing a presentation off script, but if we've practiced doing it five or 10 times, then we don't really have that much to be nervous about because we know what we're talking about. The other thing with nerves is that unfortunately, a lot of academics, a lot of scientists suffer from imposter syndrome, where we think that we're not good enough. We think that we, we, we're not confident enough to be talking about this, that people are going to catch us out because we're not experts in this subject despite professing to be experts. And imposter syndrome is something that affects many people in academia and research. It's certainly something that affects me. But it's about having that realization that you are an expert and you do know what you're talking about. And if you think about it, 
what's the worst that's going to happen in a presentation? It's incredibly unlikely that somebody would stand up and mock you for what you're saying. I have been to, as well as giving close to a thousand presentations, I have seen several thousand presentations in my professional career, and I have never, ever seen anybody mock somebody from the audience. In the vast majority, 99.99% of cases, the audience wants the presenter to do well. They want them to engage with the audience. They want them to communicate that message. And they want them to succeed. So if you think about it, when you're giving a presentation, when you're speaking with your supervisor, when you're having a telephone conversation, in almost all situations, the audience is going to be receptive of you. They don't want you to fail. And so it might seem like trite advice, but you know what, what is the worst thing that's going to happen? And if you prepare, if you think about what it is that you want to say, your narrative, if you think about your audience, if you consider them, if you think about who it is that you're saying your message to, and if you think about yourself, if you think about how you're saying that message, then they are absolutely the most important things to consider. And if you consider all three of those, then you will be an effective communicator and you will be able to get your message across so that people listen to what it is that you have to say. In summary then, this book is for everybody that has an interest in science and for people that really want to be able to succeed in the different areas, the many different areas that are expected of scientists, public engagement, grant writing, working with the press, writing papers. It's a lot to ask, but working as a scientist is also an incredibly rewarding experience. And if we can master these skills, then it's something that can really give us an incredible amount of pleasure. I hope, well, Grant and I both hope that this book goes some way in helping to facilitate some of those difficult tasks and go some way in helping to break them down. I hope, we hope that you really enjoy reading the book and that you follow the series of exercises and the additional work so that you can really get to grips with what it is to be a successful scientist at the beginning of the 21st century. I'm always happy to answer any questions that you may have in relation to science communication, in relation to being an early career scientist, or just being a scientist in general. You can tweet me at Sam Illingworth or contact me via my website www.samillingworth.com at any time that you want to. I'd like to thank you all very much for tuning in this Wednesday afternoon if you're in the United Kingdom or Wednesday morning if you're over the United States or other times depending on your geographical location. Thank you to the Institute of Physics for believing in Grant and myself in allowing us to publish this book. Thank you for your time and I'll hopefully speak to you all soon via Twitter or some other digital platform. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sam, for a great and a very interesting presentation. And also thank you to everyone for listening and for taking part. Um, I hope you found the webinar useful. Um, you can also rate it um, using the ratings button um, on the top of the presentation screen. And also please do tell your colleagues about the webinar. It will be available to listen to on demand within the next 24 hours and you'll be able to find the link to the webinar on our website, um, iopscience.org forward slash books. Um, this webinar is now over. Thank you very much.